Hello, everyone, and welcome for uh, to the special side event from Climate Change AI NURBS 2020, which will be discussing all about AI-based carbon monitoring, its opportunities and challenges. So I'm very, very excited to have you all here at this special event and also uh, the privilege to have so many great guests and speakers today attending this event. Um, and I would get straight into it. So this event is organized by many people like the ones of the Globes are the organization team. You can always write us in case you have any questions. Um, feel free to use the Q&A session here in the Zoom webinar for asking questions at any time. We will filter them out and sort them um, to the speakers. And we will start with our program with um, an introduction to dental assistance by Dr. Susan Graham, um, followed by a panel with our panelists and followed by the talk by Professor Xiao Sang Zhu from Technical University of Munich and um, a, a invited talk by Matthew Brave from Climate Trace. So let's get straight into it. I'm very excited to have you all joined today. So our first speaker is Dr. Susan Graham. She's the CEO and co-founder of Lander Systems, which is leading a powerful team to build the most powerful tools for ecosystem restoration today. The Entra system restores world's native forests through a combination of data ecology, analytics, and aerial seeding. And Dendra enables site coordinators to better manage and maintain the land across a range of industries, whether it's through identifying weeds, erosion, fauna, populations, and much more. Their high-resolution imagery offers a never-before-seen picture of land holding right down to a single blade of grass. And their easy-to-use analytics engine helps diagnose problems that create targeted action plans. So, Dr. Susan Graham graduated from the University of Oxford with a PhD in biomedical engineering in 2015. For her work as an entrepreneur, Dr. Graham was also named on the Forbes 30 under 30 list in the industry in Europe in 2017. We are so grateful to have you here. And um, the stage is yours. Thanks, David. That's a great introduction. I'll just share screen so that you can see um, some slides. Um, and it's so great to be uh, part of uh, this, this network as we build out uh, the digital networks uh, of all kinds um, and, and broadening that, that depth of all of these partnerships. And what I'd really like to explore with you today is um, some of the challenges that, that we look at. When we started Dendra Systems in 2014, we, we were faced with a number of challenges. One is this rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It, it seems to be never ending uh, in, in its increase. And when we started, we were below 400 parts per million. Now we're at 414 parts per million um, and, and on an ever increasing amount. Then when you combine that with the global tree loss, um, what, what we've got is uh, this global challenge uh, where the, there are 2 billion hectares of degraded land. We have a loss of species that is over 10 times the rate that it's been for the last 10 million years. And, and when we look at what's happening to counter these forces, uh, it's nothing in comparison. So over the last 12 years, this is the map of, of tree gain uh, globally. And, and so what you see is that there's this unfair balance uh, between uh, what we've done in terms of developing capabilities and skills to, uh, to clear land and, and to um, clear natural ecosystems compared to what we've done to restore those natural ecosystems at the same rate. It's, it's nowhere near it. And so we looked at this challenge and we said, well, what are the barriers? What is actually stopping us uh, from doing this. And what you find is that it's a lack of access. Uh, so many of these areas for natural ecosystems um, are very challenging to just physically access. Um, and, and then when you can access it with satellites and, and what have you, which give you the reach, it's then the level of detail uh, and that you might be able to see trees for conservation, but for restoration, um, you can't get that same le level of detail. And so then you've got a comparison of, okay, well, what about speed and scale? Uh, because 2 billion hectares, that's not small. <laughs> that's many, many nations combined together. Um, and, and, so, and so you've got these challenges uh, and obviously they're remote areas. 
um, because at the end of the day, uh, one of our one of our engineers said we can't code at each other to solve all the world's problems. So you need to have that balance. You need to be able to physically access these areas um, at some point. And what we've done in our approach is to tackle all of this together and say, this is not a challenge. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to restore our beautiful, complex natural ecosystems. It's an opportunity to take data analytics and machine learning to a new level by providing access uh, to, to never before seen data. And what that looks like is a, a three-tiered approach of data insights and action where we're able to collect, manage, and store uh, data that is collected by drones. Uh, it's integrated with ground data and satellite data. Then we generate insights around the whole ecosystem, the safety, the stability, the level of uh, native versus non-native elements to that ecosystem and how sustainable it is for the long term. And we use that to drive action. Uh, and as David said in, uh, in the introduction, we, we have an aerial seeding system which can go out and actually plant those trees, restore that land, make act on those decisions um, that, that are found uh, from the insight stage, as well as working in with community partners uh, and, and environmental managers to make all the changes necessary. And so when we, uh, when we look at this in action, um, we've got, and I'll... Nope, that did not play. Um, oh, you gotta love a live video. Um, what, what, we, what we have is um, an aerial seeding uh, system combined with data collection. And I'm gonna just get another video up while I talk. <laughs> um, that's able to cover the expanse of land that you, that you need. Um, and so by using drones, we're able to go out into the field and, and collect that data um, in, a, in a way that we're able to cover thousands, tens of thousands of hectares while also um, being able to get down to that resolution that is so desperately needed. And, and so when you're, when you're combining each of these elements together, um, what, what you then have is the capability to train algorithms with data that you've never seen before. Uh, and apologies for the technical glitch, but I'll, um, I'll get that back up uh, when, we, when I can. <laughs> um, so what, what this has done is previously we've said, well, wouldn't it be great to apply machine learning uh, to be able to quantify ecosystems uh, in, in this new way? But we've never had the we've never had the right data to do it, and so now what we're able to do is understand whole ecosystems in every single uh, way possible. Understand what are all the flora there? How many trees? What species are they? Um, how many shrubs? What grasses are there? Um, how high are they? How, are they growing? Are they not? Um, what's happening over time? What are those trends? Uh, and and then looking at all of those secondary metrics, like the amount of carbon, uh, the habitat features that are, that are provided, and ultimately, how is it uh, impacting the rest of the land around it? Uh, and that includes looking at uh, increasing agricultural productivity, um, providing uh, what's called forest services in the form of both clean water and clean air, but also fruits and, um, and the products which can uh, often be sold uh, when, you, when you're talking about local communities. Uh, let's not forget that 50% of biological medicines come from forests. Um, and so being able to restore these ecosystems and understand them better yields this. And so by having this better data, it's driving better analytics, improved decisions, better outcomes, uh, and ultimately increased investment. And so what it also allows is a common language. Uh, so often we're seeking a common language to be able to engage stakeholders um, from communities to landowners to investors uh, so that we can all have accountability. And then being able to complement and scale up, give, give people superpowers uh, because the people who need superpowers are the ones that are, that are fighting on the front line for the environment. Uh, and, and that's what, you know, uh, if you're here and you're, 
um, uh, a computer scientist or your machine learning engineer or your GIS analyst or what, whatever you're doing, you might not think that you have superpowers, but you do. Uh, and, and by working on this challenge, we're effectively giving those superpowers to someone else. And so what is our mission? It's to enable the scalable restoration for the natural world. And we do this through our data ecology combined with machine learning and our drone operations to achieve a better world uh, where we can tackle the amount of carbon, we can sequester carbon at scale, we can restore ecosystems to protect biodiversity, and we can give back all of those benefits to the different community stakeholders. Uh, now, we're always, we're always looking to engage with uh, different people and we're hiring for a number of roles, uh, just in case you're, you're looking for your next uh, career opportunity and it might be with Dendra. And so I wanted to share that uh, in, you know, please do get in touch uh, on that, but also love discussing different ways that we can work together. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. So technical issues are like um, <laughs> things which are very common in, in computer science. So we hope we can pull up the video and make some editing magic for people who look at the recording to see that intro video, which is really cool. So like um, a play of like drones hitting drones. <clears throat> so. Um, and I have, I have a video just now, if, if we want to share it just now, if that's yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, super. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so this is this is an example of what our data looks like. You can zoom all the way in from a satellite all the way down to an individual plant, and then analyze that at a full ecosystem level. When you look year on year, you can then do that change management. So you can see what plants got removed, uh, what ones are still there, and you, as you can see, right, that's the same area. Uh, you can do it by species. This is an example of um, tree analytics for a particular eucalypt. Uh, you can do it by, by animal species like a kangaroo. And this is all combined into our dashboard. Uh, so this is what our uh, customer sees uh, where, they, where they see it as a management tool uh, to be able to act on it. So it's very tangible. Um, often we wonder, you know, if, if you're an engineer, how, how are my results being used? Well, this is how it gets used. It gets used to make decisions and to fundamentally accelerate restoration across different ecosystems. Um, and so this, this is how you tie the loop uh, between data capture, machine learning through to, to action, uh, whether it's by drones or by people. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that video. That's definitely helpful for the audience who is like coming also from a very technical background to see that this is like technology which is already deployed in the field and which is usable. Um, it's always also great to look at the data. Um, speaking of data, um, let's move straight into the panel. So everyone who's attending, feel free to um, type in your Q&A questions um, to um, Susan and also to all the other panelists right in our Q&A chat box. Um, and we will move now straight to the panel and also welcome the other panelists who I can see just joined. So to stabilize global warming and at a safe level, the global economy needs to reach net zero within the next two or three decades. Um, this is a very tight timeline and allows only for a limited amount of experimentation and a few dead ends. Um, AI-based climate monitoring, the thing we've seen it's with the talk from Susan is one of the promising avenues uh, for knowing whether we are heading into the right direction or um, towards reaching net zero or not. However, there it has its own opportunities and challenges. So for that, um, we would like to welcome our panelists for discussion on AI for carbon-based monitoring opportunities and challenges. And would like to introduce, of course, Dr. Susan Graham, CEO of Dendra, um, who will be joining us, Professor Xiao Sang Zhu, who is a professor at signal processing in Earth Observation at the Technical University of Munich. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, Matthew Gray, who is one of the co-founders of Climate Trace, a global alliance to uh, use satellites to monitor global emissions worldwide. Thank you so much for joining us today too. Yeah, thanks everyone uh, on the panel for joining us. Uh, I have one question for all the panelists. And the question is, could you tell us a bit about your recent work and how it's related to AI for carbon monitoring, and also what do you find exciting about it? So maybe let's start with Suzanne. 
Thanks. I think that's a great question. And I, I often like redefining the question uh, or the premise. And so I'm going to take the take a liberty and, and, and do that. And we often talk about net zero. Um, for me, we are on a train right now. We're on a train heading in the wrong direction. Net zero just slows down the train to a stop. We're going to be in the wrong place. Right. We've got to then bring that train back. And so and so I, I really like focusing on going into negative, thinking about sequestration. Yes, it takes time and it's going to take steps and we need to first focus on on slowing that train. But then we need to bring it back. And, and this is why I think really let's make sure there's a, a focus on, on sequestration um, well beyond net zero. Um, so first redefining redefining the question. And I think secondly, uh, it's about how does everybody work together to make this work? So Dendra Systems really takes an approach, a data-driven approach to enable transparency, um, but also enable action. We're a very action-oriented company. And so uh, it, it's about, yes, enabling transparency and markets and what have you, but it's enabling action. And that fundamentally means partnering. That means working with others to, to get things done. And so I, I think this is a critical component uh, to achieving uh, net zero, net negative, whatever we want to go for, um, and, and to, to making it sustainable. Uh, this, this is not, this is, needs to be something that outlives all of us. This has to be a new way that we interact with our world. Um, and, and so that's what it's all about. It's about saying, how can we change the system so that in a hundred, a thousand years, everyone does something differently. That's an excellent answer. And I love your enthusiasm for it. So thanks so much for sharing. Uh, so maybe let's uh, now go to Xia Zong uh, Zhu. So could you tell us a bit about your recent work and also how it's related to AI for carbon monitoring and what you find most exciting about it? So hello, uh, I'm Xiaoxiang. So I'm uh, working on uh, um, AI for you all. This means try to extract uh, geo information from petabytes of earth station data. Therefore, we have a very strong methodological focus uh, to address the fundamental questions uh, when it comes to the domain earth observation. And on the application side, uh, we aiming at uh, um, actually tackling societal grand challenges. Uh, let it be urbanization, climate change, energy, ecology, and of course here climate uh, as the mega trend um, is um, in our focus. And uh, we have been working on, um, let's say, applications that are related, uh, for example, uh, study the polar regions and also try to derive other geo information that is uh, relevant for, for this uh, area. But I also want to speak uh, more uh, from the European uh, kind of view that uh, actually we have now put uh, digital twin earth as the European agenda for earth observation. The idea is to combine data with model, being able to do the prediction and being also to make it actionable. And uh, among all other topics uh, at the moment, um, air quality and the climate adaptation is the main focus. Therefore, um, I see actually this is a direction a lot of uh, um, scientists and other, uh, let's say, um, 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 uh, different, uh, let's say, organizations are putting effort to. So it's an important uh, topic and I stay optimistic that we can make some differences. Thanks so much. That sounds super interesting, like the digital twin earth and actionable goals. I think they are really very interesting direction they would love to hear more about. Uh, and maybe let's also now go to Matthew, if you could briefly tell us what you work about, uh, what you're working on, how it's related to AI for carbon monitoring and what are you most excited about? Sure. So, so firstly, thank you for the, the invitation to speak at this event. It's, it's a real uh, thrill to be here. So. My name is Matthew Gray. I'm a director at Energy and Clean Air Analytics. Uh, we're a not-for-profit uh, company, which is also part of the Climate Trace initiative. Um, and what we're doing at Climate Trace is we are trying to estimate data points where data previously is unavailable or doesn't um, exist to use that data for actionable insights to help drive and decarbonize the economy. So the, the sectors that 
ECAA are focused on uh, power generation and heavy industry. Um, and within power generation, for example, um, generally speaking, there is good data av availability in Europe and the US. But when you go beyond those regions, particularly in East and Southeast Asia, data becomes very sparse and unavailable. Um, and from the context of ECAA, that uh, inhibits us in terms of the economic modeling that we can do. So what we do is we model assets um, in a very precise way. So for instance, there's thousands of coal-fired power plants. What we try and do at ECAA is model those assets uh, to understand their economic and financial viability, to understand when we can shut them down in a manner that is not only consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement, but also um, consistent with least cost principles. So can we shut down these assets uh, in, in both a manner that will ensure uh, the temperature goal of the Paris Agreement is met, but also uh, can it be done in a way that provides uh, low cost electricity to consumers. I um, mean, that's, that's essentially impossible to do without good facility level uh, information, both in terms of uh, the utilization rates of those assets, but also the emissions as we see an increased focus on carbon pricing um, and other climate policies. So that is the, the motivation that we have. Um, so we go into these regions like China and Southeast Asia, and we use AI to indirectly estimate CO2 emissions. Um, we do that by drawing a correlation between the size of a plume um, coming out of either the, the flue stack or the cooling tower of a coal-fired power plant, and then we try and draw a correlation between the extent that it's being utilized. And once we know that, we can estimate CO2 emissions. Um, and it's, it's, it's really exciting for us because we hope to improve data availability, which will then, we hope, um, improve um, the potential for not only the world to um, meet the temperature goal in the Paris Agreement and decarbonize uh, power and heavy industry sectors as soon as possible, but also ensure that we are shutting down assets in a way that is gonna deliver least cost or low cost electricity to consumers, because that is vitally important, especially in these regions outside Europe and the US where development priorities are still um, essential for, um, for, for, for other aspects uh, that the government focus on, such as uh, economic growth, poverty alleviation and, and energy access. Thank you so much. I think this is really important monitoring progress towards the Paris Agreement. And then very, very curious, of course, of your talk later on how you exactly like distinguish these plumes from the factories, um, especially considering that they are like oftentimes indistinguishable from clouds if you look at it um, data wise. Susan, um, a question for you. Satellites have been monitoring forests for decades, right? As uh, many of our panelists know here. Dentra Systems innovates this space using drone technology. How do you imagine the interplay between these high resolution images and local, um, local lower resolution global data monitoring systems, um, if, if there's any? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, David. And it's interesting how um, satellites are being used today. So we sort of, when I talk about traditional methods, um, I, I do mean pen and paper. Uh, boots, people walking around or what have you, but I also mean satellite. So uh, things, you know, have been adopted fast enough that that satellite really is considered a traditional method now. Um, and, and, and so it's used for holistic planning, it's used for coordination, um, which is so important when you when you look at uh, a, a project at scale. And so the way that we integrate in today is we're using satellites for that planning step, that phase, that step one. Um, how, how are we going to, to analyze at a holistic level? And then, then we're coming in uh, to, to detail. And so what it allows is for um, a coordination at a larger scale than, than you would otherwise uh, have. But satellites also do allow for monitoring, especially of conservation. So from satellite, it's really obvious. If there were trees and now there are no trees, that, that's really obvious. For restoration, uh, until they're about 15 to 20 years old, 
you've really got dodgy data. <laughs> and so, um, you know, uh, in, if you've got bad inputs uh, to your model, you're going to have bad outputs. And, and Matthew, you would know about this as well, right? If, if you can't get the data, you've got to make up for it somehow. And so it's a much harder ask of, of how you do that. And so that's why Dendra collects the data that they do. Um, and it's also the way that we do it. Uh, ecologists are central to who we are. Uh, we created this field that we coined as data ecology um, by hiring people and calling them data ecology analysts. <laughs> and so, so we have this team of data ecologists um, who, who work in with uh, the different machine learning teams, uh, as well as, um, you know, just backend teams and, um, uh, and, and across the company, actually, uh, to be able to make it relevant. Uh, because ultimately you're asking you, you're asking an ecological question uh, and so from satellite that's where that limit comes in um, and and how frustrating it is uh, but but it is limited and so it's about saying okay well what does it bring what's the value that it brings and the value that it brings is scale um, ability to plan ability to coordinate communicate at a you know a rough level um, before before tying it in with uh, more of that drone data um, that gives you that fidelity that you need. That's really, really interesting. So let's have a quick follow up on the limitations actually on satellite data. So Matt, like, um, did you experience that also in your work? Would you consider using like more high resolution data? Are you also thinking about maybe using drone data for that purpose? Or um... yeah, I mean, I, I think it, I think it's fair to say there is. Um significant limitations with regards to what satellite imagery can do um, in terms of estimating real time or near real time uh, CO2 emissions or utilization rates of um, facilities in the power sector and heavy industry. Um, how we uh, think about that at the moment is uh, we're focused on providing a data provision that is greater than what is publicly available at the moment. Um, and as I said previously, in places like East and Southeast Asia, there is virtually nothing. So you, um, we, we see ourselves as, as adding a value um, anyway, um, but in terms of moving towards this, this, this frequency of, of near real time or real time uh, data provision, we're probably going to have to take a, a Bayesian statistical approach to infer what's happening in between images. Um, we can also um, bring in more commercial satellite images, Im images as well. So currently we use Sentinel, Landsat um, and other publicly available imagery sets, but we're exploring um, the incorporation of, of planet data, which provides one image uh, per day in theory. Um, in practice, there's, cloud, there's the issue of cloud cover, which is a problem with optical images. So when it comes to planet scope, for example, we're talking about one usable image every three days. But again, that's that's um, a, a vast step 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 up from what is uh, publicly available. Um, in terms of the incorporation of other sensor technologies, yeah, we 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 do see potential for drones, um, but we also see potential for other sensor technologies like mobile phone data, for example. So with regards to the assets that we track, um, there's either a correlation between um, the number of people on site and the extent that the facility is being utilized. So for example, more people uh, at the facility means either that the facility is operating at a higher utilization rate and therefore is burning or um, emitting more CO2. Um, that's one explanation. The other explanation is it can signify um, a maintenance event where something is broken on site and therefore the engineers come in to try and fix it. So that is a, a, another, I think, crucial uh, data point and, and sensor technology that we're, we're looking at. Speaking of the limitations of satellite imagery, and I'm so glad to have an expert like you, Sarsan, uh, today at our panel. Um, it's pretty clear that satellite-based predictions have a huge potential in aiding all our um, goals towards tracking um, pa the Paris Agreement goals, but also, of course, on other um, potential on aid decisions on direct, which directly impacts people's lives, such as, for example, 
your case with slum detection for targeted aid uh, and further. What frameworks and methods can you imagine uh, or can you tell us that could improve a model's interpretability when we are using machine learning on satellite imagery and that could help us improve also the transparency in the context of Earth observation uh, and machine learning? Yeah, so I mean, um, obviously, because of the availability of uh, global data and also advancements uh, in AI and the computing uh, facilities, nowadays, uh, probably for the first time, we are able to actually get uh, global uh, uh, geo information that are super relevant uh, for uh, climate topics uh, for the first time. But of course, uh, there are actually still quite uh, some steps to, 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 to do before it can actually reach uh, a decision making process and also all this kind of strategic planning. For example, um, um, we definitely need to, uh, for example, working on uh, quantification of uncertainties in the uh, predictions we do with machine learning models and uh, satellite data, because I guess uh, nowadays uh, get some training data, finally get some appearing uh, results that uh, can a lot of people do, but why it cannot yet be accepted by uh, stakeholders uh, for decision making, because we cannot basically give a um, confidence how reliable these results could be, how could I reproduce uh, these results, right? So this is a very, very important topic, in particular when it comes to climate related uh, things. So if you do any predictions to the future. So how do you actually get a so-called error bar onto your predictions? That's of course uh, crucial. And another thing is uh, exactly like what you said, is uh, this explainability part. So with the results, but uh, still, I guess you all agree with me, we can maximum call our um, model to be a gray box, not yet a white box. So still a lot of effort needed um, in this direction somehow uh, to really figure out uh, what are the important uh, information uh, guide to uh, certain decisions or certain uh, results. And um, I guess you are all expert. I don't need to really go to the technical detail. I can only um, emphasize uh, how important it is. And there's another thing which uh, is uh, still actually a bit uh, um, under, under represented uh, more or less uh, is the ASIC uh, aspect. So basically if we are getting global information, um, we actually uh, because of the uh, unprecedented the spatial temporal resolution and also because of the open data we are doing uh, we need to take care of a lot of things uh, among the whole chain starting from uh, data bias data imbalance when you start to uh, generate the training data tier the data privacy if uh, you are going to more to the urban uh, region and finally if you give any kind of uh, labels to a certain area if they would give any kind of uh, disadvantage for people who are living there, these kind of things, but also uh, basically how to avoid all this kind of information being misused. So these are all the things uh, which are still on the way. And I'm super happy to be here to see a group of experts who are working towards the same direction. Yeah, with all this said, I'll say, yes, we have now uh, actually a very, very good opportunity, uh, but the fundamental challenges are also ahead of us. Uh, thanks so much for mentioning so many important points. I think definitely the trust in the AI methods and also explainability are a key in order to make uh, them useful for policymakers and kind of like implementation for uh, global decisions. So these are really great points that you mentioned. Um, I'd like to uh, remind all to all our attendees, feel free to use the Q&A um, button to ask questions to any of our panelists. And we actually got one question now. Um, from Andrew Pavert. So this question is uh, um, aiming at Matthew. Uh, following up on Matthew's point about other types of sensing, is there potential for citizen science? So for example, allowing users to upload photos with location data to contribute to these data sets. So Matthew, maybe would you like to answer? Yes, I think I think absolutely there is. Um, the, the, the complication with, with citizen science is, is making sure that you have imagery um, that is consistent with the modeling framework that you develop. But I think, yeah, absolutely. With regards to our models, the more data points we can have, um, the, the better. And there certainly is um, a lack of um, available 
imagery out there for certain assets. So yeah, I think citizen science certainly does have a role to play. I think what we're thinking carefully about at the moment is how, how can we most effectively incorporate citizen science into um, the climate trace framework to ensure that um, you know, we can ingest uh, new data points and we can develop and foster um, a, a community uh, to, to help out with our mission, which is near real time greenhouse gas monitoring across the entire globe. Thanks, that's a great answer. And I think following up on this point of kind of getting data from different sources, um, I should have a question for Susan that kind of follows on those ideas. Uh, do you think AI monitoring could be also used for monitoring progress in like kind of uh, carbon capture and storage on a global scale towards the net zero target on a global scale? And if so, like uh, how can we trust uh, this type of different sources of data? Like if we have data from drones, can it be trusted on like a national or country level uh, within those applications? Yeah, I, I think this is a great question because it's the direction that we're going. <laughs> and what I find interesting from a carbon perspective, um, when you look at nature-based solutions where you're using natural ecosystems to sequester carbon, uh, is that you care about the carbon, you also care about a number of other metrics. Um, and these are often referred to as co-benefits. Um, so when we talk about how do we explain the data and how do we communicate that, um, previously, if we just remind ourselves of what the world is that we live today, is that people are often given a report, which includes you know, maybe one photo and, and then a written account uh, that these trees were planted and look here, there's a one photo and, you know, so trust me uh, that, it, that it covers this area. And that has been acceptable up until now. And we're at this tipping point where Everyone is saying not good enough. They're sniffing it and they're saying, this smells funny. I'm, I don't accept this. I don't want to pay for this, right? I don't want to pay for this, this carbon credit or, or I don't buy it. Uh, this sounds like greenwashing. And so that greenwashing radar that the community has built is at every level. That's at the employee level of companies. That's at the purchasing level. That's at the uh, head office level. That's at, 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 at the global level of policymakers. And so when you think of that, okay, everyone sniffed it out. They don't like greenwashing. They're getting very angry about that. They want trust. They want accountability. The way that Dendro Systems provides that is by giving not just one metric, but a number so that you have depth and they all work in together. All of these metrics tie in together and they make sense. And so you're looking at the amount of carbon, how much carbon has been captured by each plant uh, and, and holistically uh, by each ecosystem, uh, how many trees are in that ecosystem, how many other supporting uh, plants are in that ecosystem that contribute to the sequestration of carbon. And then what are all these co-benefits? What biodiversity has been restored? Because in the world of biodiversity restoration, that's the main benefit. What is the biodiversity? In the world of carbon, it's flipped. Uh, it, it becomes a co-benefit. And so they work in together, these, these two worlds. And when you're able to provide transparency, not just on one metric, and I imagine, and this is true for all of us on the panel today, when you can provide a little bit of exposure around what's actually going on and say, this is how it, this is how, uh, you know, we come to this number, just by how the data is analyzed and displayed, it, it tells its own story. Data can tell a story. Let's not, um, let's not silence the data. Let's let the data speak. Let's give it a voice and give it, you know, um, music. Music is not a single voice, right? It's it's all the instruments. It's all the chords, um, and and it's about bringing the right level of simplicity and the right level of complexity, just balanced, so that we can all understand it intrinsically. And that's the challenge, right? We've got this beautiful data set. We've got this opportunity to sequester enormous amounts of carbon globally. Um, now we need to frame it in a way that makes sense for everyone. Everyone's different in this ecosystem. So for, for us, we work with environmental managers who are on the ground, they're doing the work. They're coordinating the actual planting and restoration of trees for you know, over 20 years for each project. Then it's about the investors who are saying, well, show me what my assets look like. Um, you know, I've got a group of assets. 
I want to know what's there. Then it's about who they sell to, um, which might be an airline. It might be, um, you know, a, a community. Uh, and how do you then translate that message again to them? And so this is, this, this is what we work on. These are the challenges we work on um, is about, sure, you've got to do the an analytics. You've got to get an accuracy that you're really comfortable with. And we put thresholds, um, which we do not tolerate anything below. We just say it's not a product until it, it hits that, that level um, in terms of pre precision recall. And then above that, how do we communicate it? Because at the end of the day, it's not a product if it's just data. You've got to, you've got to turn that into a product. Yeah, thanks so much for the excellent answer. I think really like we are just like uh, mount, like we have mounts of data, but as you said, like data alone is not enough. We need a story and we need the right framing to make it actually useful. So this kind of nicely ties with my uh, question for Mark too as well on a similar topic, because you use more of a kind of, I guess, la larger scale, either European or like uh, satellite data. Uh, like how viable was, will be this technology towards monitoring our progress towards Paris Agreement goal and especially providing this kind of independent and uh, unbiased estimates of uh, carbon emissions? And also, do you think this can be like trusted universally among different countries and stakeholders and policymakers or are there any trust issues with this data? I, that, that's a, a, a really good and important question. I, I think um, just speaking on behalf of the other Climate Trace Coalition members, we certainly not trying to replace the, the UN FCCC monitoring, reporting and verification process um, that exists for a reason. Um, but what we are trying to do is to provide, uh, firstly, a, a, a third party account of what we think is happening across all the uh, parties who are signed up to the, the UN protocols. Um, and also help out those um, those least developed countries who really don't have the resources that some of the the, the more wealthy um, Western um, countries do. So I'm, I'm thinking about Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of um, the Pacific and Southeast Asia. We can um, provide them with an additional tool, an additional resource to help um, estimate their emissions so they can um, become more uh, effective um, members of the UNFCCC process and hopefully identify um, areas where they can increase their ambition um, and areas where they probably need to pay more attention. Um, I'm thinking principally um, uh, leakage issues like methane for instance and upstream oil and gas where there is this huge potential issue and quantifying it um, is very time sensitive because as we know, methane is um, at, at what we call it a time sensitive greenhouse gas. Um, it's, it's, it, it doesn't last um, or remain in the atmosphere as long as CO2, but it is when it is in the atmosphere, it has a very profound um, effect on the greenhouse gas effect. Those are really, really important points. Thanks for sharing them. So we have a question from the audience. Um, so Lynn Kark is asking, <clears throat> I'm really interested in ways we can integrate ML-based remote sensing with other types of models that use domain knowledge. This is particularly important if one is actually interested in average value over time, for example, when monitoring traffic or power plant utilization, but only has access to very few images. Maybe you could talk about such models that you're working on, do you train the model components separately or do you find ways to train them end to end? Maybe that's a question for you, Xiaoxiang. Yes, uh, so actually we are uh, working on data fusion with different modalities uh, across uh, radar, optical data, LIDAR, hyperspectral uh, imagery, um, social media data, and etc. So actually when it comes to the fusion, there of course a way to do end-to-end -end training, but the question is always at which level you want to basically have the crosstalks between different sensors. It could be on the feature level, it could also from the data level and also the decision level. And I think um, uh, which kind of strategy you take depend a lot on the actual application. So if you would work with 
is, uh, for example, a combination of uh, multispectral and hyperspectral data, probably you rather want to do the manifold alignment and then first try to more or less bring the data together before you do any kind of application. But if you are trying to, for example, combine uh, satellite imagery with uh, uh, Twitter, then this kind of thing is probably then more towards the later stage of data fusion. So I guess uh, this is a, a relatively, uh, let's say, the answer is it depends, but uh, actually there are a lot of work uh, that has already been carried out in the community. And I, I guess you can definitely figure out a lot of uh, already, let's say, uh, well, uh, um, um, let's say work <laughs> methods uh, there. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot give a, a very, let's say, specific answer, simply because the question is really a little bit uh, um, uh, very much uh, depending on the context. Thank you so much. We have a very specific question, though, for you now, uh, Xiao Sang, which is um, the fact that the data we are working on mostly um, is coming from communities that is data rich, right? So. Unfortunately, though, communities which are most affected by the climate crisis are also the ones with, which correlates with the least available amount of data. They are like developed countries that don't have infrastructure in collecting data. What are your thoughts on ML-based monitoring models that could potentially reflect these climate injustices? And um, do you see a danger here? Yeah, absolutely. This is a very uh, important topic. So um, this is uh, the bias we have uh, in the data. And uh, um, from my experience, uh, from what we do with global uh, information extraction, I can definitely confirm one has to tackle this issue. So uh, you need to, for example, try to do domain adaptation or try to do active learning or try to basically um, adding more samples from the, uh, let's say, uh, geographic regions uh, you're interested by really hard work. Those are all the different ways to tackle this type of problem. But what I want to say is this is an issue definitely should uh, uh, have uh, enough awareness in the community. Um, we stick with the data question. Um, and Susan, you beautifully said data is like music and we should let the data speak, right? I really, really like that. But raw data open access is conflicting. It's a conflicting topic in, in the private sector because opening it up, of course, would improve transparency and trust among potential donors and also stakeholders. But it's also a large part of business value to have that data set collected. Um, so what are your thoughts? And also that's maybe something which Matt could address afterwards. What are your thoughts on making the carbon monitoring data openly accessible and publicly available? Yeah, so when I when I think about any solution, it's about making it sustainable. And I don't just mean environmentally sustainable. I mean, sustainable in the long run, you know, in terms of markets, in terms of economics, in terms of businesses, uh, to be able to not just um, move insights, but to actually drive long-term change. Uh, and so thinking about sustainability has to be key whenever we think about these types of questions. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, what are the trade-offs? There are definitely trade-offs there um, because the value of open source data is uh, unquestionable uh, but if it then self-destructs uh, because you're not able to make it into a sustainable uh, solution um, and, and there are different ways to do that with public sector public private partnerships and things but but sometimes they're not and sometimes you get this self-destruction uh, event happening because of that and so I think it's really important to say well how do we centralize on the problem not the solution. There are lots of different solutions, open source, closed source, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, but let's centralize on the problem. We need it to be uh, a long term solution. And therefore, we need everybody, we need it to be a win, 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 we need everybody to uh, have what they need at the right time, uh, and for the right period of time. So when I often think about uh, open source data, it makes a lot of sense for academic institutions, because you're able to advance uh, knowledge bases quickly uh, and, and have adoption uh, across by many different parties, uh, where, whether they're um, for profit, not for profit, wh whoever it is, individuals. Um, and so when, when you're looking at the data sets that power uh, all of the analytics and algorithms that are being developed, 
Um, we, we take an approach where we do have uh, private data sets. Part of that is around privacy um, because uh, a lot of land is actually privately held land. Uh, and, and so you, you have these controls around that. But then it comes to, well, maybe you don't have to keep all data confidential. What data eventually will become public and where's the value in that? And that's where actually there are some win-wins where you can expose certain layers of that data and, and the level of analytics uh, from that so that the private stakeholders benefit um, as well as then enabling others uh, to be able to make decisions and, and, and improve what they do. And let me, let me give you some examples, tangible examples of where we've done this, uh, where we're able to share data sets of our insights and be able to show, hmm, we've monitored this ecosystem. And in one area, uh, we have a certain level of outcome in, in terms of uh, change. And in another, we have a completely different outcome. And from if we just kept it to ourselves, it would have remained a mystery. Why do you have two completely different outcomes when uh, arguably it's a very similar ecosystem over over a, a number of years? And and so we you know share this with our customers, and they say, well, isn't that interesting? Because we had different interventions on those two sites, right? Um, and and so when you then enable people to have tertiary level uh, analytics. Uh, you're, you're able to progress understanding well beyond what one institution or company can do. Uh, you progress it in the world of natural ecosystems, you progress it to asking, how do we control certain weeds? What soil ameliorants can we use? How do we use mycorrhizal fungi to optimize the sequestration of carbon? Uh, you, you start to go into these really interesting questions, uh, which by the very nature of them require multiple stakeholders. And so by exposing uh, and making some data more transparent, then you empower people without uh, necessarily having to share everything. You can certainly anonymize data in, in a way that's still useful um, and, and be able to have a win-win-win. Matthew, so I know that in Climate Trace, you're working a lot with the, with the publicly available data provided by uh, NASA and ESA. What, what is the role for, um, of open data for you or your project? And um, are you planning to open source your data sets you're creating and curating? Yeah, so again, like just trying to speak on behalf of uh, other coalition members, but Climate Trace is a coalition and we do um, negotiate, negotiate stuff internally. Um, but what I guess what I can say based on the conversations that we've had around this is yes, like it's a not-for-profit initiative. We are committed to providing um, publicly available data sets um, and nothing will get in the way of that. Uh, our first data sets will be at country level um, because we principally see the the main use, use case being assisting uh, the UN MRV process. Um, but in the background, we are thinking about how we can go beyond that. There's two components, obviously, model accuracy, getting our models to an acceptable level in different sectors um, are at different stages in terms of model accuracy. Um, but in terms of how we want to position ourselves, we just want to be an objective uh, data provider that increases transparency. Um, we certainly don't want to compromise um, national security or empower bad actors, which is one thing that um, could potentially occur with what we're doing with, with Climate Trace. Um, so for instance, um, the work that we do at ECAA and um, the work that our colleagues do at what time, um, those data points, if, um, if provided in a certain way, could actually empower uh, fossil fuel generators to optimize uh, their coal and gas-fired fleets to produce more, which is obviously 
not what we're trying to do here. So we're particularly sensitive about that. But I, I guess just to summarize in general, yeah, absolutely committed to making this data pu publicly available. Um, no constraints about doing that um, at national level, how we approach it from a regional and plant level, we are working that out um, over the coming months. So Shang, I'm seeing you're smiling now. Um, how important is that open data philosophy for you and the Digital Twin Initiative? Yeah, I would say um, the whole uh, community has changed a lot in the past uh, uh, decade, I would say. Um, 10 years ago, probably, um, if you talk about open science, open data in Earth observation, I guess it's more or less like uh, of long existence. But uh, nowadays, I'm super happy to see the whole community is more moving towards uh, this direction. And uh, as Matthew mentioned, probably they are sharing the same spirit. We are also working very hard and um, try to somehow uh, figure out ways uh, that we are able to basically publish um, um, global data sets we're generating, I will introduce uh, in my talk. And um, I'll say um, the, the whole community is definitely uh, working towards uh, the direction we want to um, head to. And of course, uh, given that being conscious uh, all the, all the uh, possible ethic things we have uh, when it comes to sharing such uh, non-existing and um, very valuable data, right? Yeah, thanks so much for sharing uh, all the panelists to sharing your thoughts on the open access and the data access and like what are the pros and cons of different solutions. I think these are really important uh, questions to consider. Um, I actually have a question to Matt, um, kind of following up a little bit about the access uh, of data, like your work also involves a global alliance with different stakeholders and how do you find, um, like do you find it uh, challenging if you're working with stakeholders who would rather maybe keep the data secret, especially if they're very carbon intensive? Do you experience some sort of resistance or is there any some sort of issues related to that? So, so currently we, and, and this, this might come as a surprise, currently we haven't experienced that resistance at all. Um, so for instance, in China, where you think there would be sensitivities around that um, based on the conversations that we've had, um, the Chinese are very open with regards to data transparency. It's not common knowledge, but they have um, a continuous monitoring system for air pollution of more or less all um, heavy industry and power generation facilities that are emitting uh, air pollution um, into the atmosphere, principally uh, nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide. So they are, I would say the Chinese are, are very much ahead of the curve and embracing data transparency. Um, so we haven't personally um, come into any uh, potential issues or conflicts at a, I, I would say a nation state level. I think um, there is certainly um, commercial concerns at a corporate or company level. So if we start producing production estimates or CO2 estimates of uh, facilities in cement and steel where that data is, is not publicly available um, and for the most part is, is, is considered commercially sensitive, um, that does raise uh, issues. So we're just thinking through that at the moment. Um, but in general, our approach is um, with regards to environmental externalities, we do need greater transparency on that. Um, greater information flows um, lead to, I think, better policy making, um, more informed investment decisions. So we are trying to drive and increase transparency into these um, into these areas, but in doing that, we don't want to, um, like I said, uh, compromise national security or uh, be seen as a, as an adversarial watchdog because that's um, not what we see our role being. We want to um, aid transparency with the help of um, moving the world to uh, a low carbon economy. Yeah, thanks so much. That's a very interesting question covering the different aspects. So uh, as far as I'm aware, one of our panelists, Suzanne, would need to leave uh, really soon. But if you have any final remarks, Suzanne, on opportunities and challenges, 
Uh, maybe you, you could share them very briefly and then we'll continue the discussion because we've got like several interesting questions to cover with the remaining panelists. Yeah, and I, I saw one of the questions uh, that was in the Q&A was around, you know, what's your number one greatest challenge? Um, firstly, I'm going to dangle the carrot and say, if you want to find out, um, come join us. Um, and, and often someone's number one greatest challenge is represented in the, in, in the jobs on their careers page. So we're hiring for an ML ops or machine learning operations uh, position, product manager, um, and a number of other roles. And, and, and so I'd, um, I, I think that it's an exciting space. And I think that, you know, my request would be um, join somehow. If, if you're applying AI or ML to, to some other challenge, um, ask yourself, why aren't I applying it to, to climate, to the environment, to ecology? You know, why, why not? Um, and if you don't have a really decent excuse, uh, then make the change. Um, and so that, that would be my, my one final thought. Thanks so much. That's a great thought. And I, I hope we all take it into consideration. Thank you so much for joining and making the time for it. Thanks it was so great to Thanks you. so much, Cassia. Thanks, um, David. Thanks, Matthew and John Thank Bye. Uh, and to follow up with this question, I think that's a really good question to ask uh, to our um, other panelists as well. So maybe, Xiaxiong, would you like to uh, share your thoughts on this? What is the big one biggest technical challenge you're facing today and how do you think it could be addressed? I'm sorry, uh, maybe we can't hear you, right? Or... Ah, okay, yeah, so I am. Oh, um, perfect, yeah, okay. Uh, sorry for that. So I mean, through the whole pipeline of machine learning, starting from um, generating training data sets, uh, build up, uh, uh, let's say, nice model, and then finally being able to do the large scale inference. Um, I have to say, from my experience, actually the challenge, um, the, the most biggest challenge are rather on the really large scale inference part because uh, you know there are a lot of tedious work uh, you need to do for example to dealing with uh, different uh, agencies in order to get the access to the data even though you for you are doing this for social good purposes and then you need to really uh, um, handle petabytes of data to do the inference and of course while you're doing so, you will figure out uh, the model you think the perfect model is not working as you actually uh, thought. So you need to basically do a lot of modifications and so on in order to tackle this kind of thing. I'm saying this in my experience uh, in which we are actually working on about 10 petabytes of data and try to, for example, derive um, first ever building footprint of the um, on the uh, across the globe, also 3D building functions and so on. So a lot of this kind of uh, technical issues that are rather related to the inference part. Thanks. Yeah, I can totally see that inference will be really important, especially for one like global kind of information. And actually, a follow up quick uh, question to you, since you also have acad uh, you're working also in academia. So what advice would you give to early career researchers interested in the intersection of AI and climate change, like master students or PhD students or postdocs who would like to get more involved, like what uh, areas they should focus on that would be most useful, right? Yeah, I would say, um, actually, um, when we come uh, talk about AI, EO and the climate, uh, the uh, biggest, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, resource we need is uh, young potentials. Right, so uh, we do have a lot of uh, AI uh, um, enthusiasm. They are more going to the computer vision community, uh, doing the things you know, lab uh, labeling cats and dogs and so on. But uh, actually, I just want to say, if I uh, I may, um, if you want to really see impact uh, of your uh, let's say study to the future, join us uh, more for uh, AI. Um, EO for climate and for other societal grand challenges to make a difference, yes. Thanks, that's a really great advice. That's, uh, I think that's really nice to be putting AI towards like this kind of uh, good causes. So um, just to follow up on the question, uh, also to Matthew, what is one of the biggest challenges, technical challenge uh, that you're facing with data right now? So I mean, I can try my best to to answer that, acknowledging that I'm not actually part of the, the, the technical team. So I take the data and apply it to um, real world problems within the energy sector. Um, what I would say is the biggest technical challenge at the moment is there, uh, there are issues we face with regards to 
what we are seeing in an image and what the training or ground truth data is. So for example, we will have an image of a coal plant, which um, by, 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 all, um, by all evidence, shows that it's not operating so there won't be a visual plume um, there'll be no heat signal but then when we look at the training data it's operating um, and currently there are instances there where we just don't have an answer for why that is happening um, and that's part of further investigation that, that we're doing um, but it, I, I think just giving a, a more non-technical perspective on um, this question what I'm trying to think about um, as an energy sector practitioner and someone with domain expertise is making sure that we don't over or under engineer what we're trying to do for the problems that heavy industry and the power sector have. Um, so just making sure that the data provision that we are creating is actually going to be useful for those key decision makers who are going to deploy capital into low carbon generation technologies or low carbon um, um, low carbon sources of, uh, of, of, of energy and also those um, operators who are making those operational decisions to, to slowly phase down these facilities. So that's that's I would say from my perspective at least the, the biggest the biggest issue that we're working through at the moment. We have one more question from the panel, which is uh, from the from the audience, which is question to the panel. To which degree do you adopt SAR, synthetic aperture radar, and what are the limitations which you're facing? So maybe Sao-san could answer that. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, it's very comfortable for me to answer this question because I'm from the uh, German Aerospace Center where we are uh, operating the 10X, Terra X uh, satellite missions, uh, developing processes for this kind of uh, satellite data. And myself, uh, I'm also uh, doing quite a lot uh, when it comes to machine learning for SAR. First, I want to share that um, at the moment in academia, we see much uh, low activities for machine learning in SAR compared to any other data. So I would say if you count the publication number as example, um, hardly 5% are really addressing machine learning for SAR. Although SAR is actually a very uh, beautiful and very useful data source, uh, as you all know, it uh, does not depend on whether it can get you very nice global forest uh, map, biomass, soil moisture, all these kind of things. Uh, the reason behind it is actually because uh, SAR data is not that familiar to the machine learning community. It has uh, totally different uh, characteristics. Uh, for example, uh, if you come to the statistics, uh, in radar, we are more dealing with uh, multiplicative noise instead of additive. And you have, uh, for example, this um, uh, different from the optic data, you have a limited dynamic range. For radar, you can go even to 40, 50 dB, that is much larger than the uh, optical data. And uh, of course, we have a totally different geometry, right? So if you have optical data, you look from the larger, then you see the building roofs and so on, for example. Uh, but the radar is looking to the side, you see a lot of geometrical distortion of the data as well. And finally, the pre precious, most precious information of radar is actually consisting in the face of the data, not only the amplitude. Uh, this means we actually need a uh, complex value uh, deep learning models in order to cope with all these kind of problems. So these are the barriers uh, that are there, uh, which are a bit handicapped uh, the machine learning community to actually make use of the uh, SAR data, which is, uh, in my opinion, uh, much more sexy than the optical domain. Um, but of course, uh, we are also trying our effort, for example, to uh, generate a large scale representative data sets uh, uh, that are ready to analyze, uh, analyze uh, for, for the machine learning community and so on. But I guess we also definitely need a more theoretical, um, let's say, solutions to these uh, uh, problems that I just mentioned. And maybe let's close with another and last question from the audience, which is, um, which is I think, really wonderful. Is there a way to get in touch with the panelists for more collaboration opportunities? 
So if if one of the audience members want to collaborate or get in touch with you, what is the easiest way to reach you, like to reach you? I would say drop us an email, right? <laughs> that's that's the same for us. Yeah, feel free to get in touch anytime. So we will display the email addresses later on. So um, for, for everyone who's interested in. So wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and joining this really, really exciting panel. And I would give the stage now to Isabel for the next point of our schedule. Hey, so hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, who um, also happened to, happens to be uh, one of our panelists from earlier. So um, Dr. Xiaoxiang Zhu. Um, Dr. Xiaoxiang Zhu is the professor for signal processing and earth observation at the Technical University of Munich. She heads the department um, Earth Observation Data Science at the German Aerospace Center. Um, and since May, she has been the director of the Munich Future AI Lab, AI for EO. Um, the research of Professor Zhu uh, focuses on signal processing and data science and earth observation. Um, Geoinformation derived from earth observation um, satellite data is indispensable for many scientific, governmental, and planning tasks. Furthermore, Earth observation has arrived in the big data era with ESA's um, Sentinel satellites and new space companies. Um, Professor Zhu develops innovative machine learning methods and big data analytic solutions to extract highly accurate large scale geo information from big EO data. Um, these show, for example, not only three dimensional structures of buildings, settlement types, population density, but also their evolution over time. Her team um, aims at tackling societal grand challenges, for example, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and thus works on solutions that can scale up for global um, applications with a particular focus on the developing world. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to Dr. Xiaosheng Tzu. Thanks a lot, Isabella, for the very detailed introduction. I will first share my slides. Can you see my slide? Yes, you can see. Yes, we can see. It. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm very happy to join this initiative or uh, event on climate and AI. So I tailored uh, my presentation a little bit uh, called Earth Observation Data Science meets Climate Science, and um, we are uh, working with uh, actually mostly satellites. They are a low Earth orbit satellite. Um, basically, you can see uh, why satellite orbiting the Earth, uh, Earth also rotating, we can get a global geo information. And if we steer into a certain uh, position, then we can also get a very high resolution data. But uh, clearly said that this is a trade off uh, between the coverage and the resolution we, we can um, uh, achieve. And before I start, I want to share in general uh, at a German Earth Space Center, our mission on Earth observation is to develop solutions for the following areas, ranging from global change research to Earth system environmental science, meteorology, and also UN's SDGs. Uh, if we would have very high resolution data, we also provide solutions for very practical things like resource management and urban planning. And uh, today I'm uh, coming with the three statement. My first statement is uh, in this Copernicus era, Earth observation delivers indispensable geo information of the Earth system from space with unprecedented spatial resolution, spatial coverage, and the temporal resolution. So let me start uh, what uh, Earth observation can offer today. So what you see here is a very high resolution optical data with 30 meter resolution. This is today more or less the res uh, resolution limit uh, for the civil satellites. And you can see that basically with such a resolution, uh, if you want to count the trees and all these kind of different applications, this is of course uh, very um, powerful. And this is uh, then an uh, example image of Sentinel-2. So you all know that uh, these are open data. It has uh, 13 very well calibrated uh, spectral bands. And in this image, uh, when you see the red, this is more uh, vegetated area, for example. 
And of course, uh, if we stay with the optical uh, domain, then we have a different sensors uh, that has, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, diverse uh, resolution in spatial resolution and spectral resolution. For example, if you talk about today's hyperspectral satellite, then we are uh, ending up with, uh, this is an example of MMAP uh, with more than 200 bands and the spatial resolution is around 30 meter. And in the middle, you see the uh, actually mapping power of Sentinel-2 uh, with 10 meter um, spatial resolution as this 13 bands. And if you go to World View 2, World View 3, which is a more commercial satellite, uh, consisting of uh, uh, panchromatic and the multispectral bands, then you can really already now reach to uh, several decimeter regime. And of course, uh, in the context of climate, uh, climate research, uh, if you would have a decade of data, then you can derive very important uh, climate variables. This is uh, an example of uh, Arctic sea ice. This is a super important climate uh, variable because if the sea ice melting, it will warm up the ocean, will also in turn um, uh, influence the ocean currents. Um, however, if you want to get a reliable statement uh, regarding Arctic sea ice, you, it's not enough that you only look at the data from on the past several months. Instead, you really uh, need to look into uh, sev uh, several decades. And on, in this way, you can basically get any kind of statement whether the uh, sea ice is retreating, melting, and to which extent. And with uh, 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 basically this different type of data sets, you are able to look back into the history now with satellite to 30 years ago. And these are the various of the product that the JAMA Aerospace Center are offering, uh, ranging from time scan, slow pack, uh, lead primary productivity. Uh, if you are interested in urban, this is global urban footprint and also water pack. And these are open data everybody can actually explore for your climate related research. And another important sensor is more uh, atmospheric uh, uh, spectrometer. And here, for example, you see using the Sentinel 5P, you can see the uh, uh, ozone concentration on a daily basis, and you can very well monitor how it evolves, right? And uh, now is uh, another example. Maybe I, I go back again. So this is uh, uh, basically you see the SO2 column density changes after a volcanic uh, 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 eruption. So you see how, how the SO2 has been propagating uh, starting from the uh, volcanic event. This of course provide a very important environmental variable for monitoring purposes. And uh, as I mentioned already in the panel, uh, one very exciting uh, family of uh, satellite is radar satellite. Uh, this is the example of uh, Terras X, uh, a German radar satellite in X band. Different from optical sensors, it sent packages of wave to the Earth surface and then received the echo. Basically, the brightness tells the strength of the echo, and the phase information is the most precious information, tells the distance between the satellite to the uh, um, Earth surface object, scattering object. And for example, this is just to show you a uh, radar image, and this is uh, uh, Munich. And basically, you see here um, uh, on the uh, upper left corner, you see the logo of TOOM. This was the image we taken using 27 uh, color reflectors uh, as a gift for the 150 year of TOOM. And the second mission I want to mention is Tandem X. Uh, this is a, a German uh, satellite mission. It's a, it has um, a basically a copy satellite for Terras X. These two twin satellites, uh, they're flying very closely together to form kind of interferometer. The mission goal is to generate a global uh, high quality digital elevation models. And uh, for example, this is the uh, Tunnel X uh, digital elevation model, uh, which is now uh, finished. And it has a special resolution of 12.5 uh, meter. And uh, uh, of course, with uh, uh, height accuracy, um, relative one better than two meter, it's very uh, much uh, better than the um, um, before existing um, SRTM DM. 
And basically, this is basically a, a example of a volcanic area. And then you can get a level of detail you will be able to see with the 10XDM. And this is again a very climate re related application. So if you would have for the SRTM DM, uh, which is in 2000, and the first ever uh, global uh, digital elevation model we get uh, from Canon X in 2012. And when you simply calculate uh, the high difference, you will be able to get a mass balance. In this case is the Patagonia ice field. And finally, you will be able to quantify the loss of the ice into numbers with a very uh, well um, uh, calculated uncertainty or, or um, error bars there. Okay, so this is uh, showing you the branch of the things uh, what Earth observation offer. And uh, we all know that, that we are now entering the new era because of uh, ESA's mission, this is the European view. And the, uh, the game changer is Companicos. It has its uh, Sentinel satellite fleet and uh, basically providing uh, global data uh, on a weekly basis. Important thing is that uh, the data is open and free. Of course, this brings a lot of uh, changes uh, in the uh, whole community. And uh, here I'm showing you a view of the data we have in house. So basically, you can see that um, uh, today, in our uh, uh, German remote sensing data archive, we have around 30 petabytes of data. A large portion of these are actually open and free Sentinel data sets. And if you look into the future, in 2030, we will end up with 140 petabytes uh, data. So I guess you all agree with me. Uh, we need uh, machine learning, uh, big data analytics solutions uh, in order to basically master this kind of big earth observation data. This brings me to the second statement. Um, artificial intelligence for Earth observation AI for EO is also called machine learning for remote sensing ML for RS. And the big data analytics are the way to master the big EO data. So um, in order to do so, you actually need to cover different aspects ranging from explorative signal processing methods. This is more model-based uh, retrieval uh, data fusion, this is also a topic discussed in the panel. And the information mining, uh, because if you want to be uh, carbon friendly uh, computing, then you uh, should uh, try to avoid uh, processing all the um, tens of petabytes of data, rather try to uh, basically use mining to detect uh, data which are interesting, containing change and anomalies, for example. And of course, machine learning, deep learning is a super important topic. We are more towards data-driven analytics. I will talk more about this. And uh, uh, last but not least, um, uh, if uh, we are doing global applications with petabytes of data, uh, basically we cannot uh, bypass big data management and HPC. So these are all the important elements uh, for AI for you all. And um, today our focus on deep learning and remote sensing so here is a, a paper statistics. Uh, I'm more from academia. So this is also a bit academic view. And if you look at the paper related to deep learning remote sensing, you can see that basically taking off in 2014, you see kind of exponential growth of the number of papers. This just indicate uh, this is a super blooming field. And of course the key uh, to uh, somehow develop nice models uh, for remote sensing problems is to take into account uh, the special characteristic of remote sensing data. So this, uh, you need basically tailored solutions. And here is a selection of the architectures we developed, uh, what we call our deep let's zoom. And when it comes to applications, AI for EO, we look at, for example, urbanization, I will uh, come to detail about this later. Urban planning and the safety and security. What you see here is uh, using, uh, let's say, uh, multitasking uh, network uh, to detect and tracking uh, vehicles from aerial videos. UNS SDG, the example you see here is we detect uh, large scale slums uh, from planet imagery crisis response. And what you see here is uh, uh, basically event recognition from area videos. 
climate change, what you see is uh, using um, deep learning to uh, uh, detect the uh, carbon from uh, social dynamics. We have been streaming global tweets and the Flickr and try to get, uh, for example, building functions or also try to uh, detect uh, loyalty crisis related uh, tweets. Also, for example, sentiment analysis uh, during the time of pandemic, for example. And the last example is uh, autonomous uh, driving. So if we have aerial data or very high resolution satellite data, basically we can build up uh, data sets uh, containing uh, landmarks um, uh, and everything. And this is of course uh, such a very high resolution semantic understanding of the scene is super important uh, when it comes to autonomous driving. And uh, I will go uh, to detail to a couple of examples. And uh, the first example is related to hyperspectral uh, data. So, you know, hyperspectral data has uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, spectral bands. So this means for one individual pixel, you're not only getting any kind of uh, uh, color, instead you get a really a continuous uh, uh, spectral signature. Uh, if you want, uh, this is of course very powerful if you want to uh, distinguish material on, on your scene, but they are also, for example, uh, different uh, materials have a very similar profile, uh, even though for the same, um, let's say, uh, material due to the topology, due to the illumination condition, you will also have for high interclass uh, variability. And if you would use uh, the, um, machine learning models, basically here is showing you how uh, the, uh, let's say, highly correlated uh, spectral uh, signals uh, from different uh, type of uh, material could be progressively uh, be separated when you do the feature uh, learning. And uh, for example, the red ones is soil, which has a very high uh, spectral variability. That's why you see the stretch of the uh, red points are very large. And, but of course, this is a uh, visualization only in three dimensions. If you go to higher dimensions, they could be very well separated. Of course, this is very important to support any kind of a downstream application. Okay, this one I mentioned already, so I will not go to detail. And here is another one. So basically we're using AI deep learning to uh, detect the building uh, cases. And we are working with uh, the Bavaria um, official office uh, for geo information uh, with a deep learning model trend with half of Bavaria. And we are able to basically detect uh, uh, for the whole state um, any kind of uh, old undocumented uh, constructions in the data uh, that are not in the database, also new undocumented construction and uh, undocumented story construction. And we are now uh, apply this model to every half year campaign we have uh, for the whole state. And the approach actually could also be extended for uh, all, all other states in Germany, for example. And this is uh, yet a bit more um, uh, explorative work. So it's called audio visual reasoning in association. I'm not sure if you can hear the sound. So basically for every satellite image, we are generating possible in situ sound from the satellite image through rather audio visual reasoning. If you can, I'm not sure if you can hear. So basically you see here are birds, um, sound of birds. And if it's a highway, you can hear the cars are driving uh, um, uh, through. And for residential area, you should hear kids are playing around. Okay, so um, citizen science was also a topic uh, we discussed in the panel. And here is the example how we use uh, um, uh, actually social media data. And from satellite data, we're able to get a very well building instance and also for GIS map. And if we connect uh, uh, basically street view um, um, type of images, uh, adding the labels, then basically you can pass through any kind of machine learning model like uh, CRM. And finally, we can get um, building functions uh, um, on my city scale. And here is the example of Chicago, Vancouver, and Munich. 
kind of street view uh, data, uh, you can get accuracy about 80%, up to 80%. And if you would add a top view uh, to combine top view together with the street view, you can also expect around uh, five to 10% of improvement. And of course, this is more uh, lab uh, experiment because they are using street view image, but you can also actually stream flick image and try to uh, filter out the street view image from there and to do the same um, ex uh, experiment. And there we are have uh, work rather um, in progress. And the tweets is also very valuable geoinformation data source. Uh, here we are streaming global tweets uh, since uh, more than two years. And here you see the uh, uh, distribution of geotagged tweets. And you, we can use this uh, kind of data by spatial temporal analysis and also topic modeling, for example, to figure out where are residential areas, where are commercial areas uh, with uh, uh, deep learning models. And uh, if we, we can also, for example, analyze the sentiments uh, uh, in the multilingual embedded space uh, using geotech tweets. And here, basically, you see the average sentiments, uh, how they are evolving uh, end of 2019 and uh, till April of 2020 in Europe at uh, different countries. You can observe, for example, starting from May, uh, March, uh, there is a dip of sentiment. This is because of the announcement of uh, 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 lockdown. And you can see the sentiments recovered very soon. And uh, this means uh, people get used to it uh, very fast. And uh, one very interesting you see is that uh, in Germany, we get a very low, uh, relatively lower sentiment uh, than any other European countries. I'm always wondering, maybe uh, German um, people are more serious. <laughs> and uh, the last example I show is more related to urbanization. And, uh, um, you know, urbanization is mostly happening in developing areas where we don't have appropriate geo-information. And the open data open science has been a topic in the panel uh, to give you, uh, if you talk about, uh, uh, let's say, open uh, data in other areas, you may first uh, uh, think about open street map. But the fact is, uh, we have more than 3 billion buildings in the world, but only uh, 358 million buildings has footprint in 2D in open street map, which is smaller than 12%. And only 3% uh, of these buildings, these 12%, actually have height information, which means is less than 0.4% of all the buildings. And we are basically closing this gap. For example, we have been using planet imagery, uh, using training data sets uh, from 74 cities, these pairs of satellite data and the building footprint. And then we train a graph for convolutional recurrent uh, neural network uh, to do the um, prediction. And nowadays, uh, input such a planet dose uh, satellite imagery, we will get uh, this type of building footprint out from the uh, model. And uh, if we combine with the radar uh, tom tom tomography algorithm we developed, uh, we are able to also globally get the 3D urban models. This is a kind of LOD1 model, and this is the case of Munich. And by comparing with very high resolution LIDAR, we are getting a resolution uh, height accuracy better than two meter. And for the building footprint project, uh, we have processed the whole Africa. Basically, the uh, color blocks, these are the data we have, basically covering all the uh, built area of Africa. And all together is more than 200,000 planet imagery. And basically, to show you what we achieved, um, I took the example of Cairo. Firstly, show you what are the state of the art. These are the world sediment uh, layer. The uh, only, uh, probably most recent um, global geo information of urban area we have. And this is the level of detail you can expect. And now I show you this is what we now derived uh, for the whole Africa. And you see the left hand side is the old Cairo, on the right is the new Cairo, where you see these very planned patterns. And if we zoom, then you can see that you're really being able to get the footprint of individual small buildings out from the model. And of course, uh, for this urbanization monitoring project, it goes far beyond the buildings in 3D. 
And as I mentioned in the panel, we're turning 10 petabytes data from satellite and the social media, not only buildings in 3D, but also sediment types, uh, morphologic structures, population density, and its uh, evolution over time. And uh, these are more for application side. And when it comes to methodological part, then we are very much focused on the following topic, like a combination of uh, uh, domain expertise with uh, machine learning models, reasoning going beyond the just perception, instead try to understand the spatial temporal relations and also derive for higher level knowledge from the data transferability. It's uh, very often discussed uh, whether we can use a model trend with data rich area and apply to data poor area uncertainty to get give an error bar to the results explainability. This is also one of the way how to finally being able to integrate physics into the model but also practical things like uh, deep topology learning, uh, quantum computing in AI, and also very importantly, the ethic aspect. So if you are interested in AI for you, today I also offer you three uh, benchmark data sets we have. One is the uh, um, SEN1 send, to send MS data, uh, CR data sets. This is a large scale benchmark for cloud removal consists of more than 100,000 uh, triplets uh, or for uh, Sentinel-1 data, uh, clear sky uh, Sentinel-2 and the cloudy Sentinel-2. And it's sampled uh, from more than 160 locations across the globe and across different seasons. And here you see also a very nice, uh, um, let's say, uh, cloud uh, coverage percentage, very well uh, distributed. And uh, if you are more interested in videos, we also have a benchmark for event recognition area videos. Uh, it consists of nearly 300, uh, 3,000 uh, videos with labels and which is into 25 event classes. And uh, there are many other open data sets we actually already published. For example, Subtical is a high resolution uh, um, optical matching data sets. Uh, send one to MS is a weekly supervised and then use then cover data sets uh, with multi-modality and the Brighton crops, uh, rural crops is more for agricultural applications. And uh, early next year, we will also have the dynamic earthnet data open, which is more for uh, daily land use land cover challenge and AI for food security, if you're interested. And I'm spending the time to introduce this because uh, I heard uh, quite uh, some complaints from the machine learning community that are now uh, ready to analyze data. And I hope you can find something interesting from our catalog here. Okay, so this is uh, the second statement. I need to look at the time. Um, the uh, last statement I want to uh, mention is the AI for you all has great potential uh, which is underexploited um, in contribution to climate research. So the first example I show is more related to polar region. This is a, a project we do, it's called AI for Cold Regions. It's a collaboration with uh, TU Dresden and Avi. And basically we aim at uh, tracking of ar Arctic carbon fronts, changing, uh, change monitoring for glaciers, and uh, fern line monitoring, and also degradation detection in permafrost areas. And uh, the work I present today is most related to, uh, to the first topic, which is work uh, mostly done by Conrad, a first year PhD student in my lab. So uh, the task is to monitor Arctic uh, coastline using remote sensing data. And obviously Sentinel-1 is a great choice. And basically in the image, you see uh, green is the training area, red is the validation area. And when it comes to the uh, coastline detection, we have developed a combined segmentation edge detection network for this purpose. And uh, the speciality is that we consider coastline detection as a dual inference task, like human beings, uh, on the one hand, seeing the segments of the ice and water, and also to track the edges. And we are, uh, for a more robust uh, prediction, we are doing prediction at multiple resolutions, as you can see on the um, um, screen. And also we propose a hierarchical attention mechanism to combine different uh, predictions to one. And basically for the uh, easy areas, as you can see here, 
uh, the second Kalin's ground truth, then we compare with the UNET, for example, you can see the uh, model we pro uh, proposed uh, de uh, derives a very, um, let's say, uh, clean uh, kind of uh, uh, detection results. And if it's a more complicated area as shown here, then because we have this kind of multi-resolution prediction, we can very well distinguish whether the uh, sea ice floating um, distinguish them from the actual the ice packs. And what is more important is uh, since we have both edge detection and uh, semantic segmentation module, if we look at the average deviation from coastline and the last row is our results, it improves uh, from uh, around 400 uh, meter to uh, about 150 meter. This is a very big improvement. And the possible application is uh, yet round uh, monitoring and also a current front, of course, indicates the overall Arctic uh, ice uh, uh, mass balance. And the last example I have is more related to urban climate. So for those uh, who remember the last years with very hot summer, then you can agree with me, the extreme weather is now become a very big topic. And uh, also actually starting from 2014 in the IPCC report, uh, there is the first time a chapter on urban area basically um, indicate um, the impact or for the build area on the climate, but also the impact climate has on the, um, let's say, um, our daily life. And this work is done by this group of people. Uh, basically, we are mapping the urban climate zones across the globe. And uh, it's a, a kind of a classification schema uh, describe temperature, compactness of built areas, uh, height of buildings, percentage of green. And uh, this is a uh, super important uh, classification schema if you want to detect uh, urban heat islands. But we also use this to understand the urbanization because, for example, if you look at the number seven, lightweight, low rise, this basically also correlate with the slum areas, for example. So we have been building a data sets uh, to do this task, selecting 42 cities across the globe, covering 10 different culture zones. And uh, we uh, hand label the data to one of the 17 classes. In addition, in order to get a kind of confidence of labels, for each label, we also have 10 experts to give the vote. So you can also get uh, information about how reliable this kind of label is. And it end up with more than 400,000 pairs of Sentinel-1-2 image patches with label confidence. And uh, this data is open, the link I shared before. You can basically download your own data to train your own global model. And for example, for Sentinel-2 seasonal data, we're using this standard, uh, um, let's say, rest blocks for high uh, spatial temporal feature extraction stacked with S STMs to benefit from the seasonal information to get the classification map. Basically, this is the first uh, global urban local climate zones classification map you see here. And the more interesting area is, of course, the reddish area, which is more urban area. And uh, if you zoom into any of these uh, uh, small areas, so this is uh, Delhi, and you see the uh, on the right, uh, the level of details we get on the left is more or less the state of the art, uh, what you can get on a global scale. And uh, you can, of course, uh, this data will be open. You can do a lot of analysis with this type of data. Here's just some preliminary analysis we do. Uh, basically, we see the proportion of the man-made uh, structures, which is the first 10 of the classes, more describing compactness, height, openness, and so on. If we correlate with the population density, we already see that uh, we can quantify global inequality. So around the 40% area of compact, uh, light, large, low rise accommodates 60% uh, of the total population. However, 30% area of sparse built my houses, they're only accommodating 10% of total population. So of course, without uh, this kind of uh, data, uh, you will not be able to do such a kind of uh, research. Okay, so to close my talk, I want to share one initiative we started this May. It's uh, one of the three German international future labs uh, for artificial intelligence. We are very proud over ones is um, AI for Earth observation, focused on reasoning, uncertainty, ethics. 
and it will bring 13 guest professors to Munich uh, working on these three topics. And what is more important is that we offer 70 Beyond Fellows uh, to uh, uh, doctor and postdoctor uh, students. And we offer a uh, funded uh, three to six months stay with us and uh, research with us. And uh, as uh, uh, application go, we are aiming at uh, help shaping a sustainable future. Therefore, we are interested in applications that are, for example, covering urbanization, climate, energy, ecology. And if you are interested, you can simply drop me an email. And uh, with a lot of uh, initiative we do in Munich, we try to make uh, Munich as an interesting hub uh, for uh, AI for your research. And uh, yeah, this is the invitation to all of you. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Xiaoxiang Zhu, for the excellent talk. It was definitely a pleasure to learn more about how machine learning and earth observation data can be used to tackle climate change and global development challenges. We're definitely excited to check out these open um, EO datasets. Um, so I think we can take um, one or two questions. Um, so for the first question, um, as satellite-based predictions become increasingly more granular and accurate, uh, what do you believe are the most important considerations for data ethics in the space of ML um, and remote sensing? And how can we ensure we protect data privacy and avoid misuse of data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, a great question. So I think um, um, with the increasing amount of data and uh, 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 with uh, higher spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and so on. ethic is an uh, issue. I guess this is uh, uh, clear. Uh, yet how to tackle this? There are a lot of uh, ethical guidance, uh, which are more based on um, top-down uh, approach. And uh, although we did um, basically a survey, um, let's say 70% of the research we uh, asked, uh, they read this kind of ethical guidance but nearly only 10% found them to be useful because they're not specific enough. And therefore actually in this future lab, ethics is one of the three topics. What we are trying to do is to provide a guidance rather based on a bottom up approach. So this means we will interview hundreds of AI for EO scientists with specific projects and try to basically showcasing in these different projects how we can uh, 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 accompany ethics uh, uh, into the whole process and try to basically make some um, research uh, more or less from the ethic aspect um, more, let's say, um, reasonable. Yes, so this is an effort actually we are doing. So if you ask me rather details about uh, ethical issues we care, as I mentioned in the panel, these are data bios, data imbalance, explainability of the model, data privacy, misusage of data, and etc. cetera. Great, that's an excellent answer. Um, definitely agree with you that we should um, do like a bottom up approach. Um, for the next question, um, we also touched on this during the panel discussion. Um, it has something to do with uh, data fusion. Um, so we've seen that combining data set, uh, combining satellite imagery with other relevant data sources. So for example, census data, mobile phone records, or social media data um, is a promising approach to tackle relevant social problems. Um, yet we know that um, disadvantaged populations are often underrepresented in these data sets. So for example, for using social media data, um, in developing countries, a large um, portion um, do not have access to um, reliable internet connection. So how do we navigate the problem of incompleteness and underrepresentation in geospatial data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, um, very, um, let's say, prominent uh, uh, issue we are uh, facing if it comes to uh, global um, geoinformation extraction. So since we for, just take uh, social media data as example, we have been streaming uh, global tweets uh, since now two and a half years. And you can clearly see the, where the data is rich, where is the so-called um, um, data pool area. So basically at the moment, 
uh, the strategy we do is to distinguish the uh, data rich area, so called social media data hotspot and the social media desert. And for the hotspot, uh, we're basically trying to uh, use uh, uh, social media data to increase uh, the spatial temporal resolution of the geo information we're extracting. However, for the um, uh, data hungry area, we'd rather try to really just dig out uh, probably less than 1% of very reliable information, try to use it to serve as kind of labels for satellite database inference. So I, I think this is really just one example how we could uh, basically considering the particular uh, situation and try to somehow make use of the data in a more reasonable way. And uh, I think there should definitely be, um, let's say, more initiatives uh, in general, for example, try to get more uh, um, labeled training the data for the data pool area in general, and also develop uh, approaches, uh, uh, more transferable, generalizable, uh, using all this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, um, promising techniques uh, we are research on to tackle this kind of real world uh, problems. Okay, hey, great. Um, excellent answer. Um, so uh, thank you again so much, uh, Dr. Xiaoxiang Zhu, uh, for the amazing talk. Um, I will now hand uh, the mic over to Maria Sosa to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Isabel. Coming up next, uh, we have a, ta a talk from Matthew Gray from Climate Trace, who also uh, has joined our previous panel. Uh, Matt is a director and co-founder at Energy and Clean Air a Analytics ECAA. ECAA is a founding member of Climate Trace, which is responsible for tracking emissions from power generation and heavy industry sector sectors, including iron and steel, cement, chemicals, and petrochemicals. Climate Trace Coalition is building a tool that will use artificial intelligence, satellite image processing, machine learning, and other remote sensing technologies to monitor worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. The, co the coalition aims to track human-caused emissions to specific sources in real time, independently and publicly. Matt has over a decade of energy financial experience, having started his financial career at Credit Suisse and more recently worked at Jefferies, an American investment bank where he has, was the head uh, of European carbon and power research. Matt was also a consultant to the International Energy Agency and a managing director and co head at, of the power and utilities team at Carbon Tracker, which he started in 2016. Now, for our final talk, I am pleased to, to give the stage to Max. Thank you, Maria, and hello, everyone. Just let me share my screen for a moment. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see my, my, my slides. Um, yes. Please. Okay, great. So, I'm going to speak about three things today. Um, this presentation that I'm giving follows on from a previous uh, presentation that the technical team um, for Climate Trace um, made last week with regards to the technology that we're developing um, for power generation. So what I want to do with, with my time is just introduce uh, energy and clean air analytics, then broadly talk about what Climate Trace is trying to achieve and how it's going about doing it, but then focus on um, my background. Uh, as I mentioned previously, I'm not part of the technical team. Um, I work together with my, my co-founder Shreya to think about how we can make this data that we are creating actionable to key stakeholders within the power generation and heavy industry sectors. Um, so Energy and Clean Air Analytics is a not-for-profit organization. Um, it's a new organization uh, which is was spun off from the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Um, and what we do is we build technology solutions to align energy finance with the temperature goals in the Paris Agreement. Um, so we see technology as an accelerant um, but for technology to be a powerful driver 
of the transition to a low carbon economy, we believe it needs to be coupled with sector expertise. And that's particularly important for the sectors that we are focusing on, power generation, heavy industry, where you really need to have a detailed understanding of the assets and the markets that they operate in, particularly in those regions outside um, Europe and the US where most of the fossil fuel demand will come from. Um, so with regards to, to climate trace, as was alluded to um, by Maria, um, we aim to use technology to monitor greenhouse gas emissions um, and make that uh, make that data publicly available and more importantly um, accessible to, 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 to drive change in those sectors that we're interested in. Um, Climate Trace was launched uh, in July this year, but its, its history draws back to a report that was published at Carbon Tracker in 2018 called Nowhere to Hide. And what that was, was a pilot study which looked at whether we could use remote sensing data to understand and estimate uh, the use of coal-fired power plants in regions where there was no publicly available data. Um, it turned out from that pilot study that it was potentially possible. There were huge challenges, of course, um, but it was enough to keep us interested in, and further explore um, expanding um, some of the methodologies that we had developed. Um, so what we did is we teamed up with a, a, a software not-for-profit called WhatTime, which is based in San Francisco. Um, and we applied for a Google AI Impact Challenge grant, which we were lucky enough to win. Um, during that process, we um, thought about um, expanding what we were doing within uh, the power sector. So developing a methodology to indirectly estimate CO2 emissions um, across all fossil fuel power generation technologies, so predominantly coal-fired um, generation units, but also gas and to a much lesser extent oil as well. Um, so when we were thinking about how we could expand it, um, we quickly realized that uh, what the initiative that we we're trying to develop would be well outside the scope of um, two, let alone one organization. So what we did with help from uh, google.org and um, Al Gore's office is we approached a number of other um, organizations which were doing amazing work in different sectors of the economy so that we could come together and create this global data set. Um, so we, like I said, we, we um, launched uh, Climate Trace in July um, this year um, and every Climate Trace member is responsible for a specific sector. ECAA and what time are responsible for power generation and heavy industry and all the other organizations there are responsible for other sectors of the economy. Um, the, 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 the goal or the deadline that we're working for for our first version of the tool will be in September 2021. Um, now just to take a step back and, and first explain why we developed this application in the first place. Um, it's important to mention um, in terms of climate policy, we've seen um, a lot of highly ambitious long-term commitments made. Um, and we're of the opinion that net zero climate policies are the new normal with the, the goal being net zero by 2050. I think we can um, you know, agree or disagree as to whether that is um, that is a, a, a target that we should be meeting or it needs to come before that. But we really do see this trend towards net zero is the new normal. Um, and this chart here shows how many um, nations uh, have signed up to a, a net zero target um, or are considering signing up to a net zero target. And based on the, the, the research that we've done, nearly two thirds of the economy um, is proposing or has already ratified net zero policies, which is tremendously encouraging um, and something that would have been unimaginable um, three years ago. I think if 
anyone had said three years ago that the that the Chinese government would sign up to become net zero by 2060, they probably would have been laughed at the room, laughed out of the room, but that certainly um, has happened and was announced um, a couple of months ago. And of course, with with um, changes in the the administration in the US, I think we can expect the US to join um, the Paris Agreement and with hope move to, towards a, a net zero target as well. Um, but as we move or try to implement these net zero um, targets, we, we, we really need um, data that is fit for that rapid transition, getting from where we are at the moment, um, where we're emitting around 30 uh, billion tonnes of uh, green, of um, carbon emissions a year to being net zero by 2050 is an enormous task. I mean, it's something that's that's never never happened before and has no historical precedent. So we really do need a, a data set to um, to 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 meet that rapid tr transition that we're hopefully going to go towards. Um, and with regards to electricity, there is a, a real gap in the data that we need. So this chart here shows. Um, countries in green, which have hourly or more frequent facility level data, and those countries in red, which, which don't, either have no data at all or providing regional or nation, national level or fuel specific um, greenhouse gas emissions data. Um, and the ambition of Climate Trace for the electricity sector and the, 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 the remaining um, detail that I'm going to go into in this pre presentation is to, to make this map green. So we have um, good data availability across all, um, all countries. Um, it's, and it's important to note that we, we should really focus on why we want to create this data in the first place. Um, from the position of ECAA, we produce data to service uh, the investor community um, and all the other uh, Climate Trace members have different use cases and diff different readers readerships. Um, but from ECAA's perspective, we produce these data points to help um, investors understand the energy transition and how they can realign their investments and their capital and operational decisions to meet um, the temperature goals in the Paris Agreement. So with regards to fossil fuel generation and in particular coal-fired generation. Um, when, a, when a fossil fuel facility emits pollution, it indirectly uh, tells a story about its economic and financial performance. So that statistic in the middle there, which shows 40% uh, of China's existing coal-fired power plants may be loss-making in 2018, that was a direct um, data point that we generated from uh, the report that we produced uh, called Nowhere to Hide, which estimated at facility level um, utilization rates uh, for coal-fired power plants in China. And once we had those utilization rates, we could then um, develop economic and financial models which would work out at plant level which coal plants were making money and which ones were, were losing money, with the idea being um, those plants that are losing the most money are probably going to be shut down first um, compared to those more competitive coal plants. And what we can do is we can aggregate that up to company level and then communicate that to investors. And this shows a, a flow chart of how that information is ingested and leads to an actionable outcome. So what we do is we take uh, those economic and financial models, the results from those models, and we give that to investors, which increases information information flows. Um, that in turn influences shareholder behavior. So for instance, a shareholder who now understands that um, they are owning a company or a share which is both highly exposed to coal-fired power and highly exposed to coal-fired power that is losing money, they become particularly concerned because it influences their free cash flows in the future. 
And that in turn impacts investment decisions. So those investors, once they know their exposure to coal-fired power, and in particular, which um, coal-fired power plants are loss-making and making money and understand that at a company level, that will impact their investment decisions. So they divest from those companies that hold lots of coal-fired power and in particular, and probably from a more time-sensitive perspective, those companies that own coal-fired power, which is also loss-making. Um, and that in turn creates a, a, a race to the top whereby you don't want to be the, the last investor who is um, not only holding coal-fired power because it has to be phased out um, to meet the temperature goal in the Paris Agreement, but as a really time-sensitive decision you need to make, you don't want to hold coal-fired power today if it is loss-making. That's just a fundamental um, a, a fundamental decision that an investor will, will want to would want to understand um, immediately. Um, and this race to the top um, by increasing information flows leads to uh, coalitions and initiatives which help align investor decisions with the temperature goals in the Paris Agreement. So for instance, we have uh, the Climate Action 100 initiative, which is um, the biggest investors in the world representing over 30 trillion of uh, capital under management, officially saying that they're gonna lobby the biggest emitters in the world to change their business models to be consistent with the Paris Agreement. Again, we had a, another initiative just last week called the Net Zero Investor Initiative, which is again, similar size around 35 uh, trillion um, US dollars of capital under of capital under management, um, officially saying that they are going to um, work proactively and if necessary, um, divest from companies that aren't gonna align their business model with the Paris Agreement. And again, like, like I mentioned with net zero um, targets, that's just something that, that I think would have been um, unimaginable when the Paris Agreement was signed back in uh, 2015 and I think in increased information flows uh, is plays a big role in that regard. And on top of that, making sure those information flows get to the right people at the right time in the right way. And what we do at ECAA and what our colleagues do at uh, the Carbon Tracker Initiative is speak the language of finances, which is principally what stuff is making money and what stuff is losing money, and then communicate that um, depending on the uh, type of investment that they hold. So with regards to, to our application, and just, just to um, mention again, I'm, I'm not part of the technical team, but I um, developed this work stream back in 2017. So I conceptually understand um, what uh, the techn technical team is, is, is trying to do. Um, and I'd like to share a video uh, at the end of this presentation to, to explain further. But what we're doing is we're indirectly estimating CO2 via the flu stack, which is, um, if you look at the image on the right there, those three big chimneys, the flu stacks, which are emitting predominantly water vapor, but within that water vapor, there is um, pollution, both CO2 pollution and also um, air pollution. So particulate matter and NOx and SOx emissions. Um, also, which is vitally important with regards to coal and gas fired power, is we um, are taking signals from the cooling equipment as well, um, because the cooling equipment um, emits a plume often bigger, depending on the type of uh, cooling equipment, um, bigger than the, the flue stack or the chimney. So there is, um, broadly speaking, two types of, of, of cooling um, types. There is um, natural draft and mechanical draft cooling towers. And then there's also what we call uh, once through cooling. Um, so with regards to uh, those plants that have a cooling tower, um, you can see on the left there, it is either a, a natural draft whereby um, water gets taken, um, cools the machinery, and then um, the water vapor um, from cooling that machinery is emitted into the atmosphere. And then there's also mechanical draft, which is um, a similar process, but there is machinery which is driving um, the water um, around the, the facility. 
Um, and looking at once through cooling, um, this is cooling which uh, just takes water out of a, a local waterway and then cools uh, the cools the the machinery and then um, sends the the hot water back into the waterway. And for that, there is actually no visible plume. So what we do in that instance is we uh, look at the heat signatures in the water source. Whereas with um, natural draft and mechanical draft, there is typically a, a big plume. Um, natural draft bigger than mechanical draft, but there is um, a, a plume that we can we can track track with um, optical images. Uh, whereas with once through cooling, we need to use thermal images, and that is um, tracking uh, changes in temperature of the the, the waterway. And you can see in the the, the image there um, the heat signal that's giving off from uh, very hot water um, being um, emitted into a, a, a nearby waterway. And that's one of a, a, another environmental issue that um, coal-fired power has, um, of which there is actually three. So there's obviously the CO2 impact, there's the air pollution impact, and what is um, not so well known, but I, I think um, is is of importance as well is um, the use of coal-fired power actually um, requires a lot of water and when that water gets um, discharged it is very hot and therefore can have quite a pronounced impact on um, the, the, the ecology um, of that waterway because very hot temperatures are obviously have quite an adverse effects on flora and fauna. So in terms of the, the modelling process, um, again, I, I would um, recommend that you watch the full presentation that the technical team uh, delivered last uh, last week, and I've I've included the link to that um, to that uh, presentation. But really, there's three steps to what we did. Um, firstly, we created a ground truth data set. Within that, there's the metadata, so everything that we need to know about um, the power plant, so where's, where's it located, and any technical aspects that will influence the size of the plume. So there's the technology type, both in terms of the boiler technology, but also the cooling technology, its size. And lastly, we collect um, utilization data from all those regions in the map and the, the, the previous slide that they, I showed you where there is half where there's hourly or greater resolution data, and that's what we use to train our models. Second step is we annotated cooling towers and flue stacks to focus our models. Again, um, like many people in this ecosystem, we relied heavily on OpenStreetMap. Um, and thirdly and finally, we, we developed four different types of models um, and used three different types of imagery sets. So we trained a gradient boosted tree and a convolutional neural network model um, using the region around the plant. And from that, we extracted patches, either the size of the plume or the size of the thermal image um, shown in those previous slides. We're currently relying on Sentinel-2, Landsat 8 and Planet Scope, but we are gradually expanding the number of um, different imagery sets that we use, and we hope that will give us uh, a boost in accuracy as well. But in terms of accuracy, um, for mechanical and natural draft cooling, we have achieved levels of accuracy of 80%. Um, issues still remain with open through cooling, um, and that is um, of no surprise because there is um, not a, a, a visible plume, and therefore we have to come up with other ways of tracking um, utilization and therefore um, estimating CO2. But we're currently in the process of investigating those issues to find out reasons for them and therefore develop new methodologies and scaling um, as mentioned for the release in September, 2021. Um, so that's the end of my slides. Um, before I ask uh, Maria or David to play uh, the video which explains uh, the explains in a bit more detail about how we're going about making these estimates and 
shows you some of um, the results from our proof of concept models. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, Climate Trace is an open coalition. Um, if you want to collaborate, we uh, would love to hear from you. Um, we're always looking for new coalition members um, and would like to you know, personally thank um, Climate Change AI. We think it's a, a, a terrific um a terrific initiative and um look forward to collaborating more in the future with with climate change ai because we think um it's a really useful way of bringing together uh talented and passionate people to um go after this this massive problem which is uh decarbonizing the global economy in a way that avoids dangerous climate change um so maria and david would it be okay if you show the video now. I do have it um, open on my desktop, but I think the quality of you would probably be a lot better if, if you guys showed it your end. Okay, we will show it now. Here we're plotting all of the power plants in the USA with bubbles corresponding to their most recently reported CO2 emissions. And we're going to zoom in on a coal power plant, plant called Rockport, in southern Indiana. On the top here, we're showing the three areas of interest that we're monitoring at the Rockport power plant, two cooling towers and a stack. Our machine learning models have been trained to monitor these areas of interest in order to estimate whether the plant is on or off at any given moment in time. And you can see the results of that analysis plotted below. In dark blue here are the predictions of our machine learning model, which is monitoring those chimneys for signs of plumes, as you can see on the left. And we can use the model to estimate the amount of electricity being generated for each satellite image and compare that to the reporter generation, which here is plotted in red. And you can see these two lines track each other fairly closely. In mint green here, we have the predicted emissions corresponding to the amount of electricity being generated in that month. Down below, we plot individual predictions of the model, with each dot corresponding to a prediction pertaining to a specific satellite image. So here you can see on the 1st of January 2018, the model thought it was overwhelmingly likely that the power plant was on. And referring to the image on the left, you can see clear evidence of these large plumes coming out of the monitored chimneys. Conversely, we can look at this cluster of points down here, which led to the model predicting a much lower generation during June 2019, and zoom in on that time point in order to understand the model's prediction. And on the left, you can clearly see that there are no plumes coming out of these three monitored areas of interest, which leads the model to infer the power plant is probably off and not generating at that point in time. Moving on to heavy industry, we're going to zoom in on cement manufacturing and specifically on a cement plant in northern Michigan in a town called Alpina, which is operated by Helsing Lafarge, one of the world's largest cement manufacturing companies. The way that our models analyze activity in a cement plant is very different to a power plant because there's no visual features of production. There are no plumes produced. Instead, we rely on thermal signatures. These two cylindrical structures here are rotary kilns in which limestone is heated to over 1,000 degrees centigrade to produce calcium oxide. Satellites such as Sentinel-2 and Landsat provide near infrared imagery, which we can use to detect very hot objects from space. It's on the basis of this that our models calculate the monthly output from these rotary kilns and thus the production from the cement factories. That's plotted in blue here. In red, we're comparing it to the estimated production from Michigan's official cement production figures. Again, we can then use what we know about cement production at this plant to work out how much carbon dioxide is being emitted on the basis of our model's predictions. On the left, you can see what this thermal imagery looks like. Here, we're displaying something called the normalized heat index, which is a ratio between two of these near infrared bands. Here you can see both rotary kilns are extremely hot, 
which is what leads to our prediction of maximal utilization of the cement factory for the month of November 2015. Conversely, the model predicts that in April 2016, utilization falls to about 50%. And if we take a look at the normalized heat index images for that month, we can get a sense of why that is. In fact, it looks like one of the kilns has been turned off entirely, is emitting no heat, and the other looks about half as hot as it was, leading to that prediction that the cement factory is operating at about 50% capacity. Thank you very much, Matt, for the excellent presentation and walk through the platform. It is quite an impressive platform and we are really interested for the release of these new data, open data sources uh, and looking forward to uh, impactful change that can arise from uh, this near real time uh, data on emissions. Uh, we have uh, time for uh, a couple of questions and we will focus more on a broader impact perspective. Uh, first, uh, having improved monitoring, reporting and verification of emissions uh, can shine a light on who are the players having the most impact. Could we expect uh, near real-time monitoring uh, having a simil similar ripple effect uh, as the dieselgate emission scandal had in the car maker industry? Um, so I, I think what the what this data set will do initially, if you look at um, if you take the US and the EU, for instance, which have um, reasonably well established continuous monitoring um, policies and mechanisms in place. I think rather than creating a scandal, what I think it will do is create a platform for more effective policy making. So, for instance, um, the European Emissions Trading Scheme couldn't operate with good data. Um, having solid monitoring, reporting and verify, verification data um, for emissions trading schemes and understanding the trading flows from buyers to sellers is, is vital for an effective uh, cap and trade system. Um, that's one of the things that have held back the release of the Chinese national emissions trading system. So what we hope is that this data will empower governments and policymakers to be a, a bit more ambitious about their policies and give them more confidence that they can actually track and develop policies that are going to be effective, um, but also um, raise ambition. Um, what we hope it will do is provide a more time sensitive uh, data set which will um, shine a spotlight on the NDCs, nationally determined contributions that all the um, parties to the Paris Agreement are making and create room for more ambition so we can clearly see um, you know what emissions need to be uh, made uh, to meet those NDCs and then just highlight that actually they could be more ambitious um, because of this more time sensitive data that we're creating. Thanks. That's really a good point. We should really focus on uh, getting on an ambitious track uh, the, towards reducing emissions. Uh, in that uh, context, uh, uh, what uh, sectors would be more encouraged to transition to um, a green economy paradigm? You, what do you think about that? So, so what the big integrated uh, assessment models tell us is that you need to decarbonize electricity as a priority and the reason that you need to do that is because we're seeing this trend of electrification in other big CO2 emitting sectors like heavy industry and heat um, and transport so if we can decarbonize our grids um, as soon as practical, that is going to be a big driver of wider decarbonisation um, across those other um, sectors where decarbonisation is, is, is harder to do. 
so I think what we hope is the immediate priority is that it will drive um, emissions reductions in electricity, but also um, shine a, a spotlight on heavy industry, which is what we are focusing on, to show that, um, you know, perhaps like company and country benchmarks for cement and steel CO2 intensity probably need to be revised and need to be more aggressive. Um, so if you take the European Emissions Trading Scheme, for instance, the free allocations are based on um, the intensity, the carbon intensity of those sectors. And if we have better um, facility level data, it will really shine a spotlight on those, um, those facilities that are behind the curve and those who are more progressive. Um, and that will be useful for two reasons, both for policymakers to have more aggressive benchmarks because they'll be clearly be able to see uh, those facilities which have um, which are achieving greater um, carbon intensity reductions, but also allow um, supply chains to become much more advanced in terms of um, finding those facilities which are ahead of the curves in terms of carbon intensity, and therefore create a demand signal. So. Um, for instance, big um, automotive manufacturers in Germany can directly um, get their steel from those facilities that they know are having the, the a, a, a lower environmental impact um, than those that um, are not. Thank you very much, Matt. Once again, uh, we are really excited for the release of Climate Tracker next year. Uh, and now, uh, for uh, looking at time, we are nearing the closing of this session. I pass the word to David. Thank you so much, Maria. And thank you so much to all the amazing speakers we hear today. Um, that was fantastic. I think we really learned a lot about the, the a tremendous opportunity AI carbon-based monitoring can, can provide us, but also the difficult challenges which we talked about in the panel, such as how to make sure that everything is climate, climate just and how do we cope with uh, missing data and also the limitations in technical procedure. So that was a fascinating topic and we hope you guys really enjoyed it. So some closing remarks, this session is recorded for those who um, weren't able to attend all your friends and uh, and um, you can you can share a link. So we will share a link to the YouTube recording soon on our website. In general, if you want to learn more about climate change AI as an organization, please visit www.climatechange.ai, where we are also keeping you uh, track on new events which are coming up soon, such as on Wednesday we are going to have a happy hour on Gather the Town, which is a virtual space you can uh, you can walk around in the, with an avatar and uh, chat with people using video chat. And we will be there as our co-team members to get to know us better. So we have a lot of cool events coming up and we hope to see you in the future. Thank you so much for joining today. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.